Good morning and welcome to Warrington Bible Fellowship. My name is John Sellers. I'm delighted to greet you this morning and welcome you to our worship time. Uh, today uh, I've just got uh, two announcements. Everybody say amen. Amen. Uh, one of them is next week we are going to be having our home for the holidays right after this service. So bring a dish, enjoy the time of fellowship one with another. Also coming up this Thursday is the first class of Apollos. Now raise your hand if you're an Apollos graduate. All right, look around. If, if you're curious about what all that means, find someone who had their hand raised and ask them about it because it's one of the most remarkable experiences that you'll ever have. So this coming Thursday, if you have questions, you can reach out to the church, talk to the pastors, and they can fill you in. So let's begin our time of worship with a word of prayer. Y'all pray with me, okay? Father, as we end this week of giving thanks, Lord, we can't help but give thanks to you for all that you've done for us and all that you are to us, Lord. We seek you today. Lord, as a corporate worship, we come together, Christians all over the world, to offer this gift of praise to you, Lord. Now, there may be some in this congregation and those listening that have come to this time of worship burdened with something. So Father, we ask that as we lay these burdens at your feet, that you will do your thing. And by relieving those burdens, whatever it is, Lord, if there's sicknesses, if there's disease, if there's worry, fears, whatever would stand in the way of us offering our purest gift of praise to you today, Lord, I say take care of it. Now, Father, as we open up your word today, let us hear from you. Let our hearts be prepared as we sing your word and preach your word and read your word today, Lord Jesus. And we ask this all, and, and everyone in the congregation said, Amen. 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 Worship team. Thank you, John. Well, greetings, everyone here in the congregation in the sanctuary. It's good to see you. And greetings to all y'all at home and abroad or traveling with family and such. This is the, one of those strange Sundays that we've given thanks, and it's the first day of Advent, of celebrating Advent. And you're kind of like in that limbo mode of, is it Christmas? Is it Thanksgiving? Is it Christmas? Is it Thanksgiving? So today we're going to celebrate a little bit of both. Our songs today will start with what's called a traditional Thanksgiving hymn called We Gather Together. We'll move on to um, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus and end up with So I Will Trust You. All married and met together to hopefully support the scriptures, but also what special day it is as well. And also, at the end of the set, we're going to ask you to sit down because there's going to be a new song introduced, and we'll ask you to join the chorus at, towards the end of it, and then next week we'll sing it all together. But today, without further ado, we have our first Advent readers, Peggy and Ken Franklin. We're so grateful for y'all. So I'm going to read a little bit, and then they're going to take it from there. Advent. And let me just tell you, it's from the Latin adventus, which means coming. It's a period of preparation for Christ, uh, the celebration of his birth. So Advent observes the arrival of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The wreath, which you can see over there, forms a circle that represents the unending love of God. It's made of evergreens to remind us of the life, growth, and hope that we have in Christ. And we light the candles to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. The first candle is the prophet's candle, which reminds us that God sent his prophets to foretell the arrival of Jesus, to give his people a promise and a hope. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. The Lord says, your king will make peace among the nations. He will rule from sea to sea. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you please rise and we'll join in worship together. Lord. 
Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens His will to make known the wicked oppressing. Now cease from this dressing. Sing praises to His name. He forgets not His own.
trust in you. You may be seated. So the new song that we're going to do have, has a couple of so, uh, words in it that you may say, I don't know what that means. We actually just sang one of the words, day spring. So in the song is day spring and day star. I'm going to grab my notes so I don't get them mixed up. So day spring is a word for dawn or morning or sunrise, and you find it in Job and in John as well. And then the word day star, don't get it confused with star of the morning that Lucifer was called, but Jesus was called the day star in um, first, second Peter, excuse me. It means the light bringer or the one who arises in your hearts. So the song is called the Advent Hymn. And the team's going to stand down, and I'm going to try to take this for you, but I look forward to everyone joining me here shortly. Christ whose glory fills the skies Christ the everlasting light Son of righteousness arise And triumph o'er these chains of mine Come thou long-awaited one
Hallelujah, Lord God, bless your name. And we do clap, God. We clap because we get to sing something new to you, which is a command in scripture, Lord. We clap because of the beauty, Lord, of the voices joined together in honor of you, Lord, in looking forward, the preparation of our hearts, Lord. And if we've not had a chance to prepare our hearts for worship before we came in, this song definitely did it, Father. Thank you so much, Lord. We bless you and ask you to bless the reading and preaching of your word, just as John Sellers prayed earlier in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are at our time of offering, and this is the moment we take out of our day to offer our gifts to the Lord. The things that he has given us, we give back a small portion of that so that we can build his kingdom here on this earth. So y'all just take a minute and uh, we take a little moment of silence here to, to remember and, and reflect and think ahead on, on how we want to invest in God's kingdom. So pray with me. Lord, we take this brief moment out of our service in another act of worship by trusting you with what we have. Lord, times might be tough for some of us and we think, how can we live off of 90% or 80% or whatever it is. But Lord, we know that you can do far more with just a small part of what we have and bless us as we build your kingdom here on this earth. So Lord, give peace to those who are concerned and let them see your mighty hand as, as you said in your word, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're here in the sanctuary, you can... Place your offerings and, and your tithes into the, the boxes there in the foyer. If you're listening to us online, you can send your cash or your checks or whatever into the, uh, through the mail in our 46 Winchester Street here in Warrington, or you can give through Secure Give online. All right, lots of ways to invest in God's kingdom around here. All right, now we're going to shift into our catechism, and we are on question number seven, and I'm excited to bring this to you because... Uh, it is one of the ways that we demonstrate what family we belong to, right? If, if you're like me, you were around family from this Thanksgiving time, and you could look at them and you say, wow, they got traits that I have. <laughs> Maybe that's not always good news, right? I don't know. All right? But you notice that you have some familiarity with the people around you. So we're going to say the question, what does the law of God require? All right, and then the answer that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. The great commandments, right, is summed up in those two, loving God and loving others, right? And it, what does the law of God require? Well, it requires perfect obedience, right? So raise your hand if you're sitting next to somebody who is perfectly obeying God's law all the time. I don't know if y'all can see this at home, but there weren't a whole lot of hands raised. All right, if you're at home put with your hand up, let's talk. <laughs> One of the things that we know we can't do is obey God's law perfectly all the time. We're, we're flawed humans, right? But God doesn't necessarily call us to be flawless. He does call us to be perfect in our completeness, and that's by our connection with him. Right? If you look at your families, you have this connection with them. And when you're with the people that you call family, a lot of times we feel more complete than we do when we're just by ourselves or whatever. Right? So think about that. And now if you want to understand what it means to pursue this with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, I want you to let all the breath out that you have. Really? Go. And just hold it. Just hold it. Hold it as long as you can. Now, when you want to take another breath, when you are, your body is fighting you to say, take another breath, that's how fervently you want to pursue God. With all of your heart, your heart says survive. Your mind is saying, you got to live. Take another breath. The only way that you're going to live is to breathe again. That's how fervently we are to pursue God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let me read to you what Jesus said. 
I'll be reading out of Matthew chapter 22, and it's verses 37 through 40. So it reads this way. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So in the same way that you pursue taking another breath is the way that we are to pursue demonstrating love to God and to our neighbors. And by the way, those are the people that you drive next to on the highway, (laughs) that, that you look at when you're reading their Facebook posts and what other social media. Those are the people that are your neighbors. Amen? So let's say this one more time. The question is, What does the law of God require? And the answer, that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Pastor Scott. Well, today today is a special day, not only because it's the first day of Advent, where Christians... uh, celebrate the coming of our Lord, Uh, but also today is a day when we join in partnership uh, with three who have decided to become members of Warrington Bible Fellowship. And so I'm going to call Amanda Gray and Philip and Talita Hunter forward. There they are. And you can just stand right down here. Yep, turn toward the congregation, because this is a commitment uh, not only that they are making, but that you are making to them. And so today we have the honor and privilege of joining Amanda Gray, uh, Philip, and Talita Hunter in service to our Lord. They have decided uh, to express their commitment to this body of Christ by becoming a member of Warrington Bible Fellowship. And so uh, Amanda has been with us for a few years now, uh, actually getting close to four, I think, Amanda, and uh, she completed her membership application some time ago, but we thought this would be a good time uh, to to celebrate uh, that uh, together with the Hunters. Uh, she hasn't yet been before the congregation uh, to make her commitment known, and so uh, we do this at a time when even in just a week she's going to be uh, heading back home to California as she prepares for a long-term mission trip uh, to Mongolia and perhaps for the rest of her life uh, to spend in Mongolia. And so today, Amanda is affirming WBF as her home church. Uh, And we are the people uh, who are affirming our abiding love and commitment to her as she goes uh, to Mongolia, as she goes uh, to where God uh, is leading her and in fact has been uh, orchestrating Uh, everything to make that happen for quite some time now. Now this mutual commitment of membership uh, that Amanda, Philip, and Talita, and we the congregation are making, uh, this is all a principle that is set forth in God's word. For instance, Paul speaks of our commitment uh, to one another in terms of being members of the same household. In other words, members of the same family. And so in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, Uh, Paul writes, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him also you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, and that's what's been happening uh, here and what is happening among us. Uh, And in this day and age, we simply need a way of formalizing that commitment uh, so we can tell uh, who the sheep are of this church and who the sheep are of of the church down the street Uh, because uh, we want the accountability of membership. We want uh, the the, uh, committed fellowship uh, that membership uh, provides. And so as believers, when we become Christians, we're automatically in the household of God. We, we belong to the household of God, which is his church of which he 
is the head, Christ himself, as Colossians 3.18 teaches us. And so God designed the believer's life to be lived in this kind of commitment, committed relationship with other believers. And the key to that relationship is that we walk in a way that demonstrates the unity that we have in Christ. And so here's how Paul again puts it later on in Ephesians in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And you see, isn't that the eternal value of church membership? We haven't just created this to... to, uh, to try to hold on to you, uh, but you are committing yourself to this body of Christ. They are committing themselves to you so that we can walk in the Lord in a worthy way together. And so in doing so, we're expressing our commitment uh, to and our unity with one another by serving our Lord Jesus Christ together, speaking the gospel into each other's lives in the midst of trials and tribulations and also in times of joy. And we take the good news to the lost with one voice. Isn't that amazing? And so whenever believers come alongside one another to express our devotion to Christ in this way, it is indeed a moment of great joy, isn't it? It really is. And so Amanda, Philip, and Talita, I've got a series of questions for you as you become new members of Warrington Bible Fellowship, and then I'll have a question for the congregation as well, and you will answer all of these by saying, I do. The first question, do you confess faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and do you desire above all else to live for Him? Amen. Amen. Do you declare your intention to live in harmony with the doctrine of the church as expressed in the statement of faith of the Evangelical Free Church of America? Do you promise to nurture your walk with the Lord and to love other believers in this church? And do you promise to support this congregation by your faithful attendance at its services, by your encouragement of its leaders, the willing use of your talents, which all of you have already done, uh, in its ministry and also in the giving of your means as God has prospered you. Amen. And now, congregation, please rise because here's a question for you. And you are answering it uh, not just to me, but to Amanda, Philip, and to Lita. And you will answer by saying, we do. Members of Warrington Bible Fellowship Church, Do you welcome Amanda, Talita, and Philip and affirm your commitment to love them and share the work and the fruits of this ministry with them? Amen Amen and hallelujah. You can be seated and uh, you guys stay up here because Peter's going to come and pray over you. Why don't you turn this way? Oh Lord, what a joy it is to welcome Amanda and Philip and Talita into this family, Lord, this local expression of your body, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would bless them in all their ways, Lord, that you would be especially with Amanda as she prepares for travel, that you would be with Philip and Talita as they serve uh, one another and serve this body. Father, make us faithful stewards to serve them as well. We ask your blessing upon this consecration, Lord, of these three, as they have committed their lives not only to you, but to this fellowship. And Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. I get get to give you all a hug. I love moments like this. I love the fact that we have people that are willing to commit themselves to our congregation uh, even as they go. Amanda's been a faithful attender here for four years 
And it's been exciting uh, to see her and Philip and Talita grow uh, in the Lord. And even more exciting to know you're going to be able to take all that stuff you learned here and go out with it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I got two things to talk to you about before we do that. Uh, John mentioned, John Sellers mentioned Apollos. Uh, Apollos will occur on uh, Thursday next week, not this week. I've got notebooks. Uh, some of you have already signed up. I've got notebooks for you if you would like to have them before you go home. If you're still wondering what Apollos is like and uh, you're not quite ready to commit to the class, I would invite you to come to the first class. Uh, we'll be there on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. We'll be there till 8.30. Uh, Elder Ristow will show you how to do a paper. Uh, we'll talk about what the class is. Come to class or two. If you like it, you can stay. And if you don't, well, it's okay. Uh, so if you have any questions, come and talk to me. Uh, but we'd love to have more people in the class. We've got five or six right now. And uh, Lois and Peter and I will be teaching the class. And we're really looking forward to it. It's been two and a half years since we've been able to do this. Uh, the other thing is, I, I just want to mention one more time, uh, the meal next week, uh, home for the holidays. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been able to gather together in this type of fellowship. Uh, so I want to encourage you, if, if you're at home and you're able to join us, Come on in and have a meal with us after the, first, after the service on Sunday. Um, but let's, let's just get together and thank God uh, for the way he has moved this church through a very, very difficult time. Uh, so come on down. I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to be in verses 63 through 23, 5. And... You know, I always open up with some kind of illustration, and all week long I've been trying to figure out how to open up this one, and I realized it had been laid on my, in my lap all along. Kelly and I have just got back from an extended uh, time of travel on the road. We've been in town very infrequently for the last six, seven weeks or so. We appreciate your patience in dealing with that. We had a number of things we were doing for the Eastern District, for WBF, and we had some personal stuff we were doing as well. Uh, but we got back into town Monday, eat late, and Tuesday I kind of jumped right back into my schedule. I'm down at Panera, and I was meeting a few people, and a guy walked up to the, to the table that I hadn't seen in quite some time. He used to go to church here. I sat down, he said, John, how are you doing? I said, doing fantastic. He said, um, I heard you were retiring. And I, I pardon me? He said, I heard you were retiring. I said, where'd you hear that? He goes, oh, that proves it. You didn't say no. I said, I'm just wondering where you heard that. He said, oh, you know, it's just it's several people have told me. He mentioned one or two people, none of whom came to church here. And, and I thought, uh, you know, and, and it didn't matter what I said after that initial inquiry because he was convinced. When he left, he said, well, I hope you find something to do that you enjoy as much as you did the ministry. I'm sitting there going, Wow. And oddly enough, that happened twice again last week from different people. And nobody said, hey, John, are you retiring? They said, I heard you were retiring. And every time I, I answer, I said, where'd you hear that? Well, oh, you know, words out. Okay. And so, so what, what I discovered this week is some people just don't want to hear the truth. No matter how clear you state it, no matter what, some folks just don't want to hear the truth. They, they kind of hold on to half-truths and lies and rumors that they've heard, mostly because they agree with some preconception they had. And I don't have to tell you, the preconception that went along with that idea is that John's getting old. He must be thinking about retiring. And maybe a few people put two and two together. Well, he hadn't been here for a while and you know, he's getting old, and I'm surprised. I um, you know, don't find myself in the position of Mark Twain was in the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> so Luke's gospel is rife with people like this. They see the truth, they hear it, yet they refuse to believe the evidence of their own eyes and maybe the evidence of Scripture as well. Some of the most powerful lessons in Luke come right here in this period that we're in, near the end of Jesus' ministry. That's why we kind of slowed down as we got into these final days of Jesus' ministry on earth. So we just finished the series, talked about 
uh, the power of prayer and how prayer won't necessarily help you avoid the hard situations in life, but it will help you get through them. We saw the power of darkness, that the power of darkness can overwhelm you uh, when, when it starts closing in, if, in particular if you don't know the end of the story. Now, as Christians, as believers in Christ, we know the end of the story. We don't know all the middle parts, amen? And sometimes life can come at us pretty fast and pretty hard. But we know the end of the story. We know that no matter what happens to us here and now, that we will be with Jesus Christ in glory at the end. We know the end of the story. We don't always embrace it the way we should, but that's okay. It's a human reaction. But we have been told the end of the story, and as believers, we believe it. We saw the powerless Peter. And what we learned from Peter is that sometimes you have to come to the end of yourself before you can fully live for Christ. So today's sermon, we, we move a step further. We're going to take a look at Jesus on trial. And it's just the beginning of it. Now, there are f- three phases of the portion of the trial that we're going to see today. We will see the charges levied against Jesus in 2263 through 232. We will see the cross examination of Jesus in 233. And we'll see the conclusion, the verdict in verses 4 and 5 of, ver- of chapter 23. So let's take a look at these charges. We left Peter weeping bitterly over his denial of Christ. He he was told it was going to happen. He didn't believe it. So it's one of the prime examples of what we're talking about. He just couldn't imagine him doing this. And and now the story shifts abruptly to what's happening to Jesus. Verse 63. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. Now, this is unimaginable. We know who Christ is. Amen? Amen? Son of God, the incarnation of God, God coming down in flesh to live among us and and redeem us, to save us. And these guys are making fun of him. And they're ridiculing him while they're beating him. Now, this should have recalled to the Jews that were standing around him an incredible passage of Scripture in the book of Isaiah. So when you, get, when you get home this afternoon, take a look at Isaiah 50 through 53 and compare that to what we're going to hear today. But here's what Isaiah 50 verse 6 says. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Then moving on to Isaiah 53, starting with verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. So much for the blue-eyed, smiling Jesus. Amen? A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Now our passage in Luke reveals two important truths that we need to embrace this morning. This is the end of our Thanksgiving week. We have much to be thankful for. I kept on putting up on social media. We have so much to be thankful for. You'd be amazed at some of the responses I got. But here's two things that we learned from our passage in Luke. Number one, God knew exactly how his only son would be treated. That's what we saw in Isaiah. He knew what was going to happen. And it was part of his plan. Oh, this is so hard for us to imagine. That God would allow his son to go through this. But it was part of God's plan. He described 700 years before it would happen what was going to happen when Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem on that week. Here's the second thing. Even though God knew, He still did it. He knew the suffering that was coming. He still did it. He still allowed His only Son to be tortured by the people that He created. Why would He do that? did it because of his great love for you 
and me. It's an incredible act of love. We're unable to save ourselves because we're sinners. The penalty for sin is death. But God provided a way to live forever. He provided a way to be with Him through the suffering and the shed blood of His only Son, Jesus Christ, so that all those who confess Him can have eternal life and live with Him forever. He did it because of us. Put Himself through all of that pain and torture. God was willing to let His Son die so that you and I could live. And he was going to use his interrogators and the soldiers imprisoning him and all the people that are accusing him. He's going to use them to accomplish his plan. That's worthy of some thought, isn't it? How God can use evil to accomplish his good. It's hard for us to absorb. Verse 64 says, They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? This is mockery. They're making fun of Jesus. They don't expect him to prophesy. They're inferring that he's not even a prophet at all. So here's the first charge against him. He's a false prophet. The things he says are not true. Verse 65, and they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Now, here's the second charge, and there's really multiple charges all wrapped up in it, but basically what they're saying is that the works he does comes from Satan. That's blasphemy, attributing God's works to Satan. Then in verse 66, when day came, the assembly of the elders and of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, we'll get to that in just a second, because things are beginning to move fast right now. The trial is moving along very quickly. At daybreak, Jesus is taken before the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is a governing body over Jerusalem, lay leaders and priests, led by a high priest. They had administrative and judicial authority in Israel, but they still fell under the authority of the Roman governor, still fell under the authority of Caesar, some debate over exactly what's happening here. But Jesus is being examined and he's going to be judged by this council, this hastily improvised council of the Sanhedrin. Was it legal? Well, probably not. We really don't know all the details. We have some idea about how all this was supposed to function from the Mishnah, which was written in the third century going forward. But we don't really understand how everything functioned in the first century. Was this, was this council contrived? Did it have a lot of witnesses that were in favor of the Sanhedrin? Most likely. It was very early in the morning. They would have been doing this before the city started stirring. There would be no crowds assembled under the ones that they called. Whatever the members of the Sanhedrin did here, they were afraid. They were afraid that Jesus was going to cause trouble. And they were trying to trap him so that they could kill him. They've gone from being annoyed with him to being angry with him to hating him. Now they want to they murder him. But they don't want to do it themselves. They want someone else to do it. So they say in verse 67, if you are the Christ, tell us. And so again, this is not a question. They don't believe he's the Messiah. They've just accused him of blasphemy. But, but they, want to, they want him to admit that he's the Christ. And in truth, He's already told them. I mean, if, if they've been listening, if they know everything that's been going on, they should know some of the high marks of Jesus' ministry. And he's been telling them from the get-go who he was. In verse 2, chapter 11, angels proclaim that the baby born in Bethlehem is the Christ. In chapter 2, verse 26 of Luke, right in the temple, Simeon, the prophet, proclaims it. This is one I've been waiting for. In chapter 3, verse 15, people think John the Baptist is the Christ. And John the Baptist says, no, it's not me. There's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not fit to tie. And he's a, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. In chapter, chapter 4, verse 41, the demons proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. The enemy proclaims he's the Son of God. In chapter 9, verse 20, Peter confesses it. And Jesus says, that's the foundation, that confession that you just made is a foundation that I'm going to build my church on, that he is the Son of God. 
that he's the Messiah. And in chapter 20, verse 41, Jesus says it in front of the Pharisees. So these are all things that the Sanhedrin would have heard about. They would have known these things. But here they are, trying Jesus, and they don't believe. They don't believe what they've seen. They don't believe what they've heard. They don't believe the evidence of their own eyes. They've seen him do miracles. They watched him do it. And every time he did a miracle in front of them, what did they say? Oh, you can't do that on Sunday. They don't believe. Jesus says as much. Second half of 67. But he said to them, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. In saying, if, if I tell you what he's really saying, if I say it again, you won't believe me. You didn't believe me the first time. Why do I think you believe me now? But then, at that point, I mean, we're near the end of Jesus' ministry. He, he raises a ratchet a few, few notches higher at this point. He said in verse 69, But from now on the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. That's a verse that we're familiar with. There's incredible strength here. The council has gathered to evaluate Jesus. They're really not there to evaluate him. They want to kill him. They're going to judge him. And Jesus turns the tables. He refers to Psalm 110. Go back and take a look at that later. And says, it's not you who's going to judge me. It is me who's going to judge you. And that just gets them angrier. That just makes them matter. And they conclude that Jesus is claiming to be some highly exalted authoritarian in their structure of theology. Verse 70, so they said, so are you the son of God then? Another insincere question. But the Jews know this if they can get him to claim to be the son of God and to sit at the right hand of God, they know that Jesus would actually be claiming to be equal to God. And he said to them, you say that I am. It's very wily. He doesn't clearly acknowledge your query. He comes back with, well, those are your words. Verse 71, then they said, what further testimony do we need? We've heard it ourselves from his own lips. They haven't. They haven't heard anything from his own lips. But the third charge is blasphemy. And the great irony of everything that they said and everything that Jesus says is all true. It's not blasphemy. It's biblical scriptural truth coming from the mouth of God himself. Verse 23, chapter 23, 1 says, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. Now, you, you, we need to set the scene here so that you understand what's coming. They, they all go. The, the, the whole Sanhedrin is going to go over to Pilate's place, and there's going to be this show of strength. Look, we're all united. This is what we want. Okay? And meanwhile, they've got Jesus. Uh, and Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus is bound. So the, the leaders all show up at Pilate's house with Jesus bound and looking very much like a common criminal. He's beaten a little bit there too. And, and, and that's, when, that's when the finger pointing begins. They have to convince Pilate to execute Jesus. So they begin to lay things on extra heavy and make their case. And verse 2, and they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king? And of course, none of the accusations are true. This didn't pop up uh, earlier. But out of them rise our fourth charge against Jesus. He's a liar. He's been lying. So the Sanhedrin doesn't have the authority to execute a criminal. Rome doesn't give that to them. Only Romans have that power. So they take Jesus and all of their trumped up charges and he's a false prophet. He does the work of Satan. He's a blasphemer. He's a liar. Uh, none of which have been proven. And they take Jesus to a higher power. Now we hear that word bandied around a lot today. 
my higher power. And we're, and we're, we're always talking about somebody that has more authority, more power than ourselves. That's what the Sanhedrin's doing. And, and so Pilate is that higher power in the eyes of the Sanhedrin. And he begins to cross-examine Jesus. Now, Roman trials, had, there were two types of Roman trials. One was a full-fledged trial. And the other was, went in three stages and happened before one individual, one judge. The charges were presented in these abbreviated trials. This is what's going on here. And there was a thing called a cognitio examination, which were questions asked by the person in charge. And then the verdict is delivered by that person in charge, by the judge. Now, this is how Jesus' trial is being conducted here in Jerusalem. Uh, it's kind of like traffic court, the difference between a full-blown uh, trial where you've got a jury of uh, witnesses, a uh, jury of your peers. Uh, the difference between that and traffic court where you go stand before the judge and try to convince him that you're not guilty, and he calls you guilty and makes the fine anyway. So the, 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 the idea is that in Pilate's case, the judge has the authority to execute the accused. So Pilate's function as a governor, we have to understand the situation here, was to collect taxes and maintain the peace, maintain the order. As long as he did that, he was pretty much left alone by Rome, by Caesar and his cohorts. But if there was trouble, Pilate could very easily be replaced, and probably when that happened, he would also be beheaded, hung, knife in the back, whatever. So looking at things from Pilate's perspective, his primary goals are to avoid any trouble with the Jews. He just doesn't want any trouble. He wants to keep the money flowing and make sure that everybody stays loyal to Caesar. So the heaviest charge levied against Jesus, as far as Pilate is concerned, is that he claims to be king. Now that's a direct opposition to the authority of Caesar. That's the charge that Pilate zeroes in on. And so that leads us to our cross-examination. Verse 3, and Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews? What Pilate really wants to know is, are you a revolutionary? Are you going to cause trouble? Is any of this true? Do you call yourself a king? Because if you call yourself a king, then Caesar's not going to be happy with that, and I'm going to have to do something. Now, John's depiction of this whole scenario is a bit more complete. Let me read it for you. John 18, 33 through 38. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? So, has somebody planted this idea in your head? Or is this something that you've seen, Pilate? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Now that should uh, fuse Pilate's concern right there. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not here to compete against Caesar. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. Pilate would understand that. If he was really a king, his subjects would defend him. But my kingdom is not of this world, he says it twice. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come to the world to bear witness to the truth. He's here to bring truth. And he says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate says to him, what is truth? And after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Now, Luke's version is simpler than that, but it gets down to the crux of the matter. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers Pilate back in Luke, you have said so. And if we put, if we put all of the gospel depictions together and do what we call a harmony of the gospels, fill in all the blanks with each other, what you get is Jesus saying to Pilate, I'm not here to make trouble for you. I'm here to be a bearer of the truth. I'm here to speak truth. Other people are making the trouble. And if you read in between the lines, you're saying, I'm not just king of the Jews. I'm king of everybody. 
My kingdom isn't here. It's in heaven where everything started. Pilate hears Jesus very clearly and hands down his decision. Here's the conclusion of our trial. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Ouch. Now, in John's gospel, Pilate says those words right after saying what is truth. And what Pilate's trying to say to Jesus Christ, oh, nobody really knows what truth is. We think this is a modern idea, don't we? Yeah, the, the floating truth, the, the target that keeps on moving and keeps on changing. Pilate's saying, who knows what truth is? And even at it, he utters the most truthful statement ever known, made by any man. He says, I find no guilt in this man. He's the only one that have ever walked amongst us that was absolutely perfect. He's not guilty of anything. And Pilate utters the truth. And the Sanhedrin, they're not happy at all. This didn't go the way they wanted it to. Verse 5, but they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. They've taken Jesus to the higher authority only to hear that he's not guilty. So they begin shouting, He's got the whole nation in a turmoil. You don't want this kind of trouble, Pilate. Next thing, somebody from Caesar is going to come and visit you because you can't control the situation. Now, do your job. So we see these, these three phases of this so-called trial, the charges, the cross-examine, and the cl- conclusion. And, and there's, there's gold in here. Listen to this. The trial of Jesus and Peter's denials are a study in contrast. We see the contrast between the previous passage and this passage here. And the first thing we see is that a disciple fails. He fails spectacularly. Through lack of nerve, he's he's unable to stand up and defend his teacher. The second thing is that the soldiers are coldly and arrogantly insulting the one who's about to die, who came to die for people just like them. Came to die for people just like us. People have thought they knew everything. People thought they had a handle on it. Thought they were good people and needed a savior. The third thing we see in this is that leadership is make this calculated effort. I mean, every step is planned ahead of time. They're working in coordination with each other. This isn't just some random thing that's happening. They've got everybody together at the exactly right time of day. They probably woke Pilate up, to, to, and, and everything is moving towards making sure that Jesus is condemned. The mother of all plots. And finally, through this whole thing, Jesus remains calm. He doesn't get upset. Doesn't start throwing lightning bolts at anybody. Doesn't smite anybody. You know how much I like that word. Doesn't get angry. He doesn't even really defend himself. He just speaks truth. He's an example of obedience while suffering. The trial, the trial is a sham. It's a joke. But God is going to use this joke that these guys have put together to accomplish his will. Jesus' testimony is going to lead to his conviction because the claim is just too radical to believe. It's too dangerous to leave alone. That one man could be the son of God. That one man's sacrifice could pay for all of our sins and all of our debts. And just as we've seen in every case where Jesus has made an appearance in the public in Luke, his presence demands a decision. What will I do about Jesus? It's too radical to to embrace and too dangerous to leave alone. And as readers of this, we're challenged to make that same decision. We haven't seen the end of the Gospel of Luke yet. We're familiar with it. We know what's going to happen. And even even as we ponder those decisions we have to make and those truths that we have to learn, we find out that a disciple, brothers and sisters, 
a disciple can fail. He can drop the ball. He can stumble. He can get it all wrong. And later on, not too, too long from right here in Luke 23, we're going to find out that if that disciple who fails, who didn't do the right thing, who did exactly the wrong thing, if he fails and repents, he's restored to fellowship. He's forgiven. God's grace is incredible. We found out that when the situation turns dire, We can buckle if we're not prepared for it. We can cave if we're not ready for it. If we think that our relationship with God is a bright and sunny pasture, as somebody once told me, that everything's going to go right. And we get blindsided by life. If we're not prepared for it, we can cave in. We can can lose it. Praise God. Even if we do, God's grace will cover us. Amen? Amen? But we need to be prepared. We'll be talking about that as we go into next year, being prepared. Finally, we see the soldiers. And we see how angry the world can be in reacting towards Jesus, in reacting towards the gospel. Cynicism dominates the picture there. We live in a cynical world, don't we? And day by day, the world is less and less eager to hear what we have to say. Through it all, we see God's plan moving steadfastly forward. And one of the great ironies of what we're seeing right now is that movement is actually orchestrated by the one that they're trying to put on trial. Everything they do plays into his hands. What an awesome, amazing, wonderful God we have that can take the mess that we make of our lives and do something beautiful with it. I mean, that's the biggest lesson we see here because this situation in Pilate's place is a mess. It's it's dominated by anger, judgmentalism, self-righteousness, all the things we're told to avoid. They're coming to the surface, and they think they're driving the situation, and what they're doing is they're driving it right into God's hands. It's absolutely incredible. So we have this judge who has a type of temporary authority, Trying to judge the judge that has all the authority. And we're left with the question of which judge do we want to stand before? Because we will all be judged. There will be a day of accountability. But the scriptures tell us that those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be judged not unto condemnation, but unto glory. And those who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be judged in the condemnation and eternal fire. Which judge do you want to stand before? Pilate or the King of Kings? Now, perhaps the most startling thing that we would learn from this passage is that nothing should come as a surprise. The Scriptures... And Jesus Christ told anyone who was willing to listen what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. The only thing we ever have to address is, do we believe him? Do we believe the scriptures? I heard three times last week, I heard you're going to retire. And I told you, it didn't matter what I said. All three people that I talked to, they don't, we haven't had these ongoing relationships. It just kind of came out of nowhere. I think maybe God was trying to tell me something. Amen. Okay. But when I finally said, no, I'm not planning to retire. You need to hear. I'm not, I'm not planning to retire. I don't know what God has. He may take me home this afternoon. Pray for me. <laughs> okay. But I don't plan to retire. 
I told you a long time ago, I've been called to be a preacher. God has blessed me with a gift that just goes beyond my imagination. Uh, the privilege of standing in front of you on Sunday mornings for the last 20 years. Next year's 20 years. I, every Sunday, I just kind of pinch myself. I can't believe I get to do this again. So I feel called to be a preacher, but I also feel called to warrant about the fellowship. And if you'll have me, I'll be here until I go into his presence. I've told the elders, and Peter has promised me that he would, that when I stop making sense, they were going to have to drag me off stage. So I'm going to have to trust you <laughs> if that happens. But I have, I have no plans to move on. And, and if you hear that rumor, just tell them the truth and say, John says no. They won't believe you either. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay. And, you know, and, and what, what, I want, what I want you to carry away from this is that you might not necessarily have to trust me, but we have to trust the Scriptures. The Scriptures are the truth. And I'm here to tell you. I, I, I've said this before. You're going to hear it coming from me again. I, I think bad times are coming for the church. I, I think we're going to be on hard times, and I think we're all going to be around to see it. Now, call it a leading, call it whatever. I pray that that's not the case, but I think it's happening. I think we're watching it roll out right now. And my job and my passion is to equip you with the truth of God's Word to navigate those hard times. So you're not going to come in here and hear a soft gospel. You're not going to come in here from either Scott or myself or Jimmy, whoever is speaking, and hear some nice object lessons to be taught to you that you can take home. You're going to hear Scripture. And in, in the middle of the pandemic, when everything was locked down and everybody, every other pastor I was talking to uh, was feeling the burden of having a flock they couldn't see. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing guys weep and fall into depression and everything. I got charged up because I thought this is the way forward. Just keep doing what God has called you to do from the get-go. Preach his word and leave the rest up to him. So until you guys vote me out, you're stuck with me. And as long as you're stuck with me, you'll be stuck with the scriptures as well. I hope that's a blessing to you. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your, your word. And Lord, we, we go beyond thanks and when we see how it weaves together, how this incredible book, 1,700 years in the making, 40 authors contributing to it, different languages, different cultures, how it tells one story from the beginning to the end. And we pray, Father, that you help us by the presence and the power of your Spirit to embrace those words, to incorporate them into our lives, Father. Let us be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And whatever's coming down the pike, Father, we put our faith, we put our trust in you. You'll help us navigate those waters because of the great promise you've given us that nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing can snatch us from your hands. So while we toil away here on earth, doing the things you've called us to do, being messengers of the gospel, we look forward to that day when we can find the ultimate rest in you. And we pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us online.